NTV Wild Talk in partnership with the Kenya Wildlife Service and Wildlife Direct. Hello and welcome to NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Bidyarthi. Now today we're coming to you from two locations. One of them is the Wildlife Direct offices here in Nairobi and the other is the Amboseli National Park. Now earlier in September, a drastic and dramatic exercise was undertaken in the park. Tim, one of the world's most iconic big tuskers, was darted and collared and this is why. The county of Kajiado is home to the Amboseli National Park, where hundreds of majestic elephants roam the land with Mount Kilimanjaro towering in the backdrop. But Kajiado County is also one of the regions most affected by human wildlife conflict owing to its proximity to the park. Farms filled with lush fruit and vegetables dotted close to the park tend to attract hungry elephants who help themselves to a plethora of food. But this wreaks havoc on the livelihoods of farmers whose hard work go to waste due to crop damage and destruction. And so the communities take revenge. Several times this conflict has resulted in death of either humans or elephants. Tim, one of Amboseli's biggest tuskers, has more frequently than not stepped into farmers' territory and faced the wrath. Consequently, Tim's life has been threatened twice and to protect both parties, it was decided that Tim needed to be tracked. Well, one of the people that was on the ground in the Amboseli National Park and witnessed the collaring of Tim firsthand was the CEO of Wildlife Direct, that is Paula Kahumbu. And she joins me now to tell us all about it. Paula, thanks for joining us on the show NTV it's Wild good Talk. good to be here. Great to have you with us. Paula, now many, many people can resonate with the magnificence of uh, Tim, this huge elephant. But there are many people that actually don't know who Tim is at all. So introduce us to him. Okay, so Tim, I first met Tim several years ago in Amboseli. And uh, he's just this magnificent, gigantic elephant who um, has tusks that are so long, one of them reaches right down to the ground. And I took a photograph of him and had him identified and I was very surprised when I came back to the park a year later with students he walked right up to our car he walked around us took photographs of him with the backdrop of Kilimanjaro and uh, he was in must which is in breeding condition and he had come to look for mates in the park and he came close to your car he came right up to us <laughs> <laughs> maybe he's, a, he's a, a stunning stunning bull and um, the more we looked at him, we realized actually he's quite unusual in his size. He's very, very tall for his age. How old is he? he he's 48 years old, according to the Amboseli Trust for Elephants. So they've been studying him um, for his entire life. He stands, I think it was 4.8 meters at the shoulder. So wow. he's a very, very large bull. And, you know, his tusks are two meters long. So he's um, gorgeous as an elephant. This. Uh, ranks him among the big tuskers and big tuskers are the elephants of Africa whose tusks go all the way down to the ground. There are very few big tuskers left in the world because of the poaching epidemic. Well Paula, you know despite Tim's magnificence and his huge huge tusks and his beauty, he has in fact been quite troublesome to many many people especially in the surrounding Amboseli area and his life has even been threatened before. Why is this? Well, you know, like so many elephants in Amboseli, this is a, a small park. It's not fenced on any side and the elephants move in and out all the time and that's part of their survival strategy. So they spend most of their time outside of the park. And the population growth in the area, especially the expansion of um, irrigated agriculture, means that an elephant like Tim will constantly find himself um, interacting with people and of course maize and potatoes are much tastier <laughs> than grass and palm leaves um, so he has taken to raiding some of the farms but what's uh, probably more dangerous is that 
he's he's a big bull and like so many big bulls they're accompanied by other bulls right so they live in bachelor groups and he has friends who often hang out with him and they learn from him and he's so big um, and strong that he can defy anybody there, there really isn't anybody who could stop him from raiding their farm really? and uh, twice he's been attacked the first time was in November of last 2014 uh, we found him with um, a spear wound on his back. We reported it to the KWS. They did dart him with the David Sheldrick Trust. He was darted and treated and he recovered. Um, but at the time, one of my board members just said, you know, we'll lose him. If we don't do something to save him, we're gonna lose him and what will it take? And of course, there was the worry that you'd lose Tim because of this human wildlife conflict. Yeah. By Tim raiding the farms it meant that people were losing their livelihoods and of course people became yeah. aggravated towards exactly. all the elephants, not only Tim. Exactly and to be honest Smitty, uh, more elephants are killed in that area because of human wildlife conflict than because of poaching. In fact the poaching is very low but uh, there's been so many cases of elephants being killed but in retaliation people are also being killed. So in the Kajiado area alone, we've lost, I think it's six or seven people this year. Right. So elephants are a real challenge to live with. Um, it doesn't stop us <laughs> from finding solutions. And Tim represents this phenomenal opportunity to um, not just save the community from crop raiding elephants, find solutions that work for them, but also find solutions that will save this big tusker who needs to pass his genes on. Right. We don't want the big tuskers of Africa to die out. Well, speaking about solutions, now the potential solution was let's collar Tim. Um, how did this idea come about and who was involved and um, what happened? So when we first saw Tim with that injury, one of my board members said, you know, what's it going to take? How do, we, how do we prevent Tim from being killed? And we sat with the KWS on the ground and they said, look, if we can put a radio collar on Tim, we know where he is, we can stop him from going into farms. And, you know, it took us a year and a half to get to the point where we actually did do the operation, uh, we had to raise a lot of money mm. because it's not just um, obviously putting the collar on, which is already expensive, it's the cost of tracking him every day. So like Ahmed before him, yeah. Tim will have 24-7 protection. He'll have uh, people around him who will be able to prevent him from going into farms, chasing him back out. Um, and that means that the, farms, the farmers themselves will be safe as well. Um, and of course, so by a radio collar, that is literally like a collar, like, for example, um, a dog would have a collar around its neck, but a huge collar around the elephant that then you can track the elephant. Absolutely. So these radio collars nowadays are incredible. Um, they speak to satellites, but they also speak um, to the, the handheld radio transmitters. Okay. What it means is that every hour we know exactly where Tim is, where he's located. And if he's near a farm, uh, we can get a warning and say he's approaching a certain area right. and it means you can get on the ground and um, uh, warn people on the ground and also prevent him from going into those right. farms. Right and uh, we'll, we'll talk more about how it actually works later once um, we find out what really happened right. but you mentioned that it took about a year or so to actually get this process underway. Why was that? Was there conflict in decisions? Uh, you mentioned a lot of raising of money was involved. Uh, tell yeah. us more about which partners so, were uh, funnily enough, the fundraising was the easiest. Oh, really? Our donor said, I will, I will pay. And uh, we raised money not just for the collar, for the following team and also for a uh, fence to keep him out of certain wildlife places. Wildlife Direct. That's through Wildlife Direct, yes. Um, and the, the donor is this uh, amazing uh, New York-based uh, businessman called Scott Ason. Mm -hmm. So that was the easiest part. The difficult part was to get decisions made. Don't forget, KWS has been going through a lot of changes. Um, at the time, it was difficult to get a decision at the highest level that we dart this particular one elephant. Because don't forget, elephant problems are all over the country. Sure. And we were saying we want to focus on this particular individual elephant um, who is a problem. And because of the problem, the community on the ground were also very unhappy. Some people just wanted him to be killed. Yeah. Right. So and we, w we had to really work with uh, both sides, the government and the communities and say, hey, l why don't we work together and let's protect this elephant and protect the community at the same time. We also had conservationists on the ground who are concerned. Tim is 48 years old. He's a middle-aged elephant, right? <laughs> he uh, is very large. And in the past, elephants have died during the darting operation. Really? So there was a real concern that Tim might uh, be darted and he may not wake up again. Some serious risks involved. Absolutely. And 
can you imagine losing a big tusker because you're trying to save him? How that was anyone forgive yeah, themselves? There, there was there was really uh, a lot of consideration and delays and rethinking. At one point, we thought, well, why don't we collar one of his mates, maybe one of his friends, mm -hmm. who we know stays around with him, but it, it was no guarantee. His right. friends aren't with him all the time. Um, and in the end, he got speared a second time. And at that point, I think um, it really helped us to come to a faster decision. And it was, we will lose him to angry communities or to a poacher mm -hmm. uh, just because he gets himself into dangerous situations and we need we needed to stop him from going into the farms as well as stop anybody from killing him and, and draw attention to him he is uh, a very rare individual he certainly is yeah. well let's take our viewers now to the ground Paula to Amberselli you were there along with all the other teams save the elephants uh, KWS and everybody else involved some community members yeah. as well what happened in Amberselli how how huge was this task right. so I mean so many of us had been on these kinds of operations before um, it's it's incredibly exciting because you have to find the elephant and dart him. Now in the past, KWS has actually done it from the air with helicopters, but in this case we're doing it from the ground. And the landscape was quite very bumpy, not quite, it was very bumpy <laughs> right. and it was very bushy, so it was quite hard to get a clean shot um, to dart him. But what we had was a really extraordinary group of people there. We had not just um, Save the Elephants, who were responsible for the technical side of the collar, we had the Kenya Wildlife Service who were responsible for security and safety and uh, the operation itself, the veterinarian side of it. We had the Amboseli Trust for Elephants whose job was to really uh, take the biometrics, so measure and record all the statistics from this particular elephant. And Wildlife Direct, and we came in with um, the community. Mm -hmm. So we worked with the local community, particularly with the women. And uh, so it was a really extraordinary opportunity to engage these different and diverse partners who sometimes don't work together at all because we all have different fields of expertise and working together for just one day for one purpose. <laughs> and one so elephant. Was, yeah, and, and, and you know, when you dart an elephant, you only have about 40 minutes. Yeah. You've got to do everything in 40 minutes. You can't dilly-dally. It, it almost reminds me of when we darted uh, the rhino in exactly. Old Pejeta. Yeah. Uh, we darted that rhino to, to notch his ear, but yeah. um, similar sort of exactly. you know, experience. Everybody needs to know exactly what their job is, where they're supposed to stand. Somebody's in charge. Um, there's a lot of risks. There's a lot of risks. Um, and, and there's also just a lot of excitement and a real sense of achievement uh, that, that we actually can do this together. Right. You know, it's the only way that we're going to save elephants is actually by working together. So, so it, was, it was really interesting. Well, take us through um, how it happened. I mean, like you said, you had to probably drive through the terrain yeah. to, to find Tim. Did you find, right. you know, elephants and think that might be Tim? Oh, actually, so it's not Tim. <laughs> Who is Tim? Where so is what Tim? was, uh, I was in one of the lead cars. Um, Kitili was in, Kilimbathi was in uh, the other car and then the veterinarian was in a different car. And these three vehicles uh, went ahead from all the other vehicles which had to wait because you can't afford to scare the elephants. If they're running, you're obviously not going to dart them and also their blood will be racing mm -hmm. and the dart won't work anyway. So three vehicles had to approach him. Tim is a very calm elephant. He's, he's an amazingly gentle, docile elephant. The gentle giant. He, is. he really say. is. He really, really is. He's quite amazing, but he was with these other two bulls. Townsend, who's his nephew, and an elephant called Craig, who actually looks so much like Tim that we're certain they must be brothers from <laughs> okay. another mother, you know, <laughs> right. seriously. Um, and so he's with these two friends who he hangs out with. They're, they're just grazing calmly. And the vehicles start approaching and they just kind of walk away. They're not very scared. They're just walking gently away and the vehicle is nudging them and trying to get closer and closer and closer. Uh, our vehicle at one point just stopped to to watch and see and we were being called and told position yourselves here or position yourselves there uh, and that was because we didn't want Tim to move into a very wooded area yeah. or into a place where we can't see him that would make it so difficult him. exactly <laughs> Once he had been darted, all of the vehicles just had to gently kind of maneuver to push him into an open area. And um, 
it was it was just hilarious to be watching him seeing his two friends not really understanding what's going on because you can imagine it's like being drunk or something <laughs> right so their friend tim is probably slurring his words they have to <laughs> they're trying to understand what's going on over there and they eventually they they walked away but you could tell they were quite confused mm -hmm. they didn't know what was going on and tim at that point was had slowed down so much that he stopped moving he was dragging his feet at first and he stopped moving and then he just started slumping backwards it was very funny and i noticed that the vets had already gotten out of their vehicles and they were running towards him right and he started slumping backwards and his legs his back legs just gave way and he just fell down but he didn't fall over and it's really dangerous to leave an elephant in a sitting position or in a, on its chest because they can they can die from the asphyxiation yeah. they can't breathe so they had to run over and push him and i jumped out of the car to run <laughs> and help push them but i just thought it was such a beautiful photograph of this gigantic elephant and these two tiny people <laughs> trying running, to running yeah and trying to push him over um, so I stopped and I took photographs and, you know, once he was down, it was just like a puff of dust and he was, he was just down. As much as it was a fascinating experience to watch, Paula, it must have been very, very daunting because now Tim is down and we don't know what next. Exactly. I mean, once he was down, you could hear him breathing and every now and again, it was like he would stop. And, and you're not sure if it's because he's just holding his breath or has he just stopped breathing? Let's take a break at this point, Paula, thank you. More when we come back, we'll find out what really happened to Tim after he was down. Time for our wild guest question though, your chance to win an awesome prize, here it is. What defines a big tusker? What defines a big tusker? To participate, you must like the NTV Wild Facebook page. Only answers posted on the timeline post that's associated with this question will be considered. The first person to answer correctly wins two nights for two at the incredible Old Tukai Lodge in the heart of Amboseli, with magnificent views of Mount Kilimanjaro and elephant families. The winner also gets one bottle of wine courtesy of Wines of the World and a gift hamper courtesy of Wildlife Direct. Terms and conditions apply which can be found on the NTV Wild Facebook page. Last week's lucky winner was Janet Nandwa Ongoli. Welcome back to NTV Wild Talk. Here now is a reminder of our wild guess question. What defines a big tusker? What defines a big tusker? To participate, you must like the NTV Wild Facebook page. Only answers posted on the timeline post that's associated with this question will be considered. The first person to answer correctly wins two nights for two at the incredible Old Tukai Lodge in the heart of Amboseli, with magnificent views of Mount Kilimanjaro and elephant families. The winner also gets one bottle of wine courtesy of Wines of the World and a gift hamper courtesy of Wildlife Direct. Terms and conditions apply which can be found on the NTV Wild Facebook page. Last week's lucky winner was Janet Nandwa Ongoli. So before we took the break, Tim, the massive bull elephant, was darted and down. Paula Kahumbu, the CEO from Wildlife Direct, was on the ground. She witnessed it all. Paula, your heart must have been beating. Once Tim was down, what happened? Well, uh, it's kind of chaotic. It, well, it looks chaotic, but actually it's very, very organized. Um, everyone then has to get to him as quickly as possible and do what they had to do. So a lot of planning had gone into this. And everybody had a very specific role and responsibility. There were people whose jobs were just to fit that collar and make sure that it fits on him because he was such a huge elephant. 
there were people whose jobs were just to do measurements. It looked like a massive collar though. Uh, the collar actually, it turns out, uh, Save the Elephants had to do a double collar. Really? Yeah, because Tim is the biggest elephant that's, they've ever collared and they've collared hundreds of elephants. So uh, in a way that, that confirmed our you know, recognition of Tim as this magnificent animal. He, he is huge, huge elephant. There was some man whose job was just to make sure that Tim's breathing airway was clear and that he was continually breathing. Others whose job was just to keep him cool because, you know, lying down, his body is just heating up and heating up in the sun, but also his own body uh, met, um, metabolic rate. So he has to be cooled down constantly with water on his ears. Um, the vet is, you know, only monitoring his vital signs and making sure that he's okay. And then the rest of us got to just in interact with uh, Tim at such close quarters. So that's when we brought the Maasai women to come and actually touch an elephant for the first time in their lives. Which must have been amazing for them, Paula, because these Maasai women, women rather, tend to often look at these elephants as a problem. They were quite scared. When I first called them, they <laughs> stayed back. Really? And I had to you know, get someone to come and translate. I said, no, ask them to come closer. And they came and they put their hand on his legs. And I think that, that uh, something happens when, you know, this is no longer just an animal over there. This is now somebody you've touched. And um, they wouldn't go that close to his face. They touched his tusks. They touched his legs and his feet. They were fascinated with his feet and his gigantic toenails. <laughs> um, and then they started smiling. And uh, one of the ladies said, you know, we asked her, how do you feel about it? And she said, she was so happy. She said, I'm so happy that we've been able to call it Tim because people forget that in our culture, elephants are the women's cows. Right. Yeah. You know, there is also um, a shot, Paula, of you stroking Tim, but looking rather worried or concerned, what was going through your mind at that time? Well, I think I was not unique. Yeah. All of us mm -hmm. who have been involved in these operations before know how quickly things can go wrong. Um, if Tim, for example, got up too soon, he would be a threat and anything could happen. But the worst than that would be that Tim doesn't get up at all. And we had been warned, we had been cautioned, uh, we knew that it would be a disaster if Tim didn't wake up. So I, I guess it was always on my mind that after all this, it might, it might not still work. We would only <laughs> be able to smile really <laughs> once Tim is up and about again. Right. So yeah, it was, it was very tense. It was very, very tense. It's hard to describe what it was like. I suppose you've just got to be there to really understand um, how critical the exercise is. Yeah. But of course, uh, Kitili Mbathi, the Director General of the Kenyan Wildlife Service, uh, was there as well, witnessing it, um, also mm. looking rather tense at times. Um, but here's a little bit of what he had to say about the exercise. Putting this elephant down, I mean, is just almost traumatic just to watch. This is for the benefit of communities first and foremost, and then for the benefit of Tim. So we're going to be able to monitor him. But, you know, when elephants go into people's shambas, people uh, have an antagonistic um, uh, sort of relationship with the animals. So if we can keep Tim away from people's shambas and let them appreciate the people who are coming to see Tim, then I think it's going to be a mutually beneficial relationship. Paula, what happened next to Tim? Because there's so much activity around him, everybody is concerned, but everyone's doing their job. The collar is on. What next? Well, <laughs> you know, once the collar was on and uh, Tim seemed to be fine, I have to say, there must have been about a thousand selfies <laughs> really? taken. <laughs> While because Tim was down, yeah, obviously. I, I, think, I think that um, we failed to recognize it, it was actually quite momentous. This is the biggest elephant we've ever darted in Kenya and uh, put a radio collar on him. So everyone who was there wanted to have a selfie with that elephant, including the Maasai women who really? have ne also never been that close to the <laughs> yeah. elephant. So there were a lot of photographs taken. And then at, uh, at a certain point, the vet said, OK, everything is done. Um, all the data has been collected, the collar has been tested and it's fine. Everybody has to get back in their vehicles and we're going to put in the antidote. 
to revive to him. revive him yeah and, and the antidote works you know very quickly it can, it can take a minute to five minutes there have been incidents where a very big elephant like Tim um, can't even get up quickly and so they they also lay down some ropes in case he doesn't get up you can actually use a car to help wow to sort of pull yeah, him up so they, they they tie them around their tasks and they literally pull and um, in Tim's case, thank God we didn't need to do it because I was in the car. Right. <laughs> I was supposed to be pulling him. But what, what I've seen before happen is an elephant gets up and then the first thing they do is they look and they, they're, they're upset. They've probably got a headache. They see people out there and they just charge. Mm -hmm. And so you've also got to be ready to get out of there as quickly as possible if that happens. <laughs> so Tim's given the antidote and he just lay there. And he just lay there and we were all, you know, monitoring every second it was every second was taking ages um, he his ear flapped because initially his ear was laid over his face and then his ear flapped back but he still just lay there and I could see Katili who was opposite me in another car and he was just I think really worried that Tim wasn't gonna get up and then Tim started you know, rocking himself slowly slowly and, and he eventually got up and, and I realized we were all holding our breath. Nobody even, I don't think anybody even took a photograph. We were just holding our breath that he does get up properly. And he did and he got up <laughs> and he shook his head because I'm sure that that new collar must have felt very strange on him. Right. And he did this very funny circle. He looked like a, a model <laughs> showing off her new dress because he probably a was trying to figure out. Model. <laughs> a great looking model. <laughs> And, um, you know, he clearly looked at us. He looked at all the vehicles and he didn't, he didn't chase or charge anybody. It was very strange. It was almost as if he knew that these aren't your enemies. And he just turned his back to us and walked away and didn't even look back at us, you know. It was really quite amazing. It was probably the best darting operation that I've ever participated in. There Why is that? In, in terms of what happened, mm. just because he, he didn't have any problems getting up, he got up and he showed us that he was fine. And then he walked away, he didn't show any aggression. You know, the, the risk is that he would, could have been really ma mad with people and start sure. chasing people, which would have meant he'd have to get shot just because of that, you know? Right, I mean, and that would have been the worst thing sure. possible. And there, were, there, was, there were hundreds of people from the community had come to see and they were not far away. Wow. He could have gone running towards them yeah. and he didn't. He just turned and walked straight back towards the park. But what was very cool, so all the cameras filmed him as he walked away and he walked off towards the park. And then we all said how wonderful it all was and we all left. And um, as we were having lunch, somebody came over to us and said, oh, I recognize you guys. Um, you know, look at who I've just seen. I've just seen Tim. Wow. And he had photographs of Tim. And we said, that's great. Where have you seen him? And he said, oh, I just saw him just in the park, just a few minutes ago. And we had not told anybody that we'd done this operation. This was all kept completely secret because we didn't want any news to get out until we were sure that he was OK. And so we said, um, did you notice anything different about Tim? And he said, no, <laughs> he's fine. He's just his usual calm self. Yeah. Oh, but he was, wearing, he was wearing a radio collar, uh. you know. And so we knew that he had actually had seen Tim and we went off to look for him. And it was just amazing because we went into the location that he had described him, mm. very close to the Kenyawala service headquarters. And we, didn't, we couldn't see Tim. But we found Townsend and Craig. And that's the nephew and the friend. <laughs> exactly. Okay. And they were walking very decidedly. We were trying to get photographs and they just didn't, they were walking right past us. They were just definitely going somewhere. And I was with Katito and she said, they're looking for Tim. Mm. They know where he is. Let's just follow them. Yeah. And we did. And within a few minutes, um, they found Tim under a very beautiful umbrella tree in Acacia. And he was just standing there cooling. It's like he was waiting for them. Wow. And they came up to him and it was so cute because Townsend is very small compared yeah. to Tim. <laughs> and he was almost like he was scared. And he walked over to Tim and, and from a distance with his trunk, he just reached out his trunk and started touching Tim oh. and underneath his ear and checking out the collar. Really? And he was sniffing the collar, yeah, and checking it out. And Tim just stood there and he waited for a while. It was almost like he was saying, OK, have a look. Yeah. Are you happy now? <laughs> OK, let's go. Right. And then they all walked off. You know, um, it, it, it was thankfully a, a big success but Paula at the same time having this collar around an elephant's neck is something very unnatural 
Um, what, what do you make of that? I mean, it is, of course, there to protect the elephant sure. and to ensure that, you know, there's less human wildlife conflict, but it's not the most natural sure. thing to do. No, of course it's not natural. And a collar weighs about six kilograms. Wow. Okay, Tim weighs about six tons. Wow. <laughs> so, so it's uh, less heavy for him than, you know, <laughs> something that I'm wearing. It's not, it, it's unnatural, but he probably doesn't notice it that much. For I, I was watching his behavior to see if he was annoyed with it because he could have reached his trunk down and tried to do something with it. Yeah. He obviously could smell there was something funny going on, but he, he wasn't too bothered at all. Um, some of the things that we have to do to save animals seem to be really strange. Mm -hmm. We put up fences, yeah. um, we put collars on them, we dart them and we mark them in all kinds of ways. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, in a world where we have more people than the landscape can can tolerate, we have to do that if we want to keep these animals alive. Well, tell us now, how is this radio collar going to work? Because such a dramatic exercise, how is it going to help the situation? So, so it's really interesting. This collar obviously communicates with the satellite and sends a, a beacon of his location every hour. Yeah. It's, the information is only accessible by a few people. So, so I have it here on my iPad. I can show you where Tim is. Mm -hmm. In fact, let me show you right now so you can get a sense of, of um, what's happening with Tim's movement. Right, so you are actually so, able to monitor where Tim has gone, whether he's yep. out of the park or getting close to a farm. And so, exactly. And what I, what I can show you right here, and we, unfortunately we can't show it to the public, but I want to show you what happened. So Tim was darted here. Okay. He moved into the park and he spent quite a lot of time in the park. Right. Um, and then he moves throughout this whole landscape. He's moving hundreds of kilometers every few days wow and in some places he's actually very close to farms yeah i mean what we're but seeing here on this ipad is literally um tim's movements um you know there's crisscrossing lines all over this ipad that demonstrates tim's path and like you, and you said, can Paula, see what's amazing is you can see where he moves slowly yeah you can see where he moves really fast he right. runs in certain places <laughs> and here you know he's calm and he's relaxed what's nice to see is that he hasn't gone into any farms. Okay, he's, but yeah, what, if, just, you know. what if he gets close to a farm? How is the collar going to help? Uh, what so happens this is, when you this see is what's that? so great about this. And this is why the partnership is so brilliant. Yeah. So one of the main partners in this operation is Big Life. And Big Life have rangers. And like I said, with Ahmed who had his 24-7 uh, guards, mm. Tim has 24-7 guards through Big Life. So the oh. funding we raised enables them to literally follow him and make sure that he doesn't go into farms and to repel him if he does go into farms. And so I'm hoping that, you know, in coming weeks or months, if Tim does go to farms, they will be able to report back to us and I can tell you yeah. that um, Tim has been pushed back. Is this the way forward though, Paula, um, to manage human-wildlife conflict? It's one of a whole, I think, suit of uh, tools that we are going to have. There are all kinds of interesting um, new developments coming up. So, for example, you could even have, I don't know if you've seen these things on dogs where they have a collar and if it goes near something, the collar buzzes on right. their neck. It doesn't give them a shock, it just, it just vibrates and right. it gives them a fright. You could actually do this um, for elephants and they're now doing it for lions. In parts of Kenya, they're now testing this technology, which is it's called geofencing. Basically, the animal can go wherever it wants, but if it gets too close to a place where you don't want it, it will get... Um, Something will happen. It could be a sound or yeah. a vibration. Something and that will that make irritates. It, yeah, it'll irritate them and they won't want to go there. Um, so we can do this for a number of different species. And obviously with elephants, because they can carry a big collar, mm -hmm. you could actually do that. And it, Kenya would probably be the first place to test, test this. So that would be very exciting. Um, uh, in the long term, the future of elephants will be that we keep landscapes open. One of the most difficult things we're facing in Kenya is a place like Ambaseli, and in that whole Kajiado um, and Birikani area, you have an expansion of ag irrigated farming. Yeah. And it's coming about because there are natural springs. And in the past, it depended on who could afford a generator. Mm. Well, today, with all these Chinese generators in the market, everybody can afford a generator. Yeah. And so they're pumping these uh, natural springs. And elephants need water. And they need food, obviously, but they mostly need water. So their water is being drained by the expansion of these farms and the farms are just um, springing up yeah. all across the range of elephants. So it's our failure as a nation to actually design the corridors that these elephants need and they're 
key landscapes and secure them because you could actually just fence an elephant's range away from people so mm. that people can farm safely and elephants can move freely. Yeah. And elephants are amazing, they're very adaptable. You look at what happened up in Mount Kenya and the Aberdares, mm -hmm. just by creating an underpass under the main yes. uh, the, the Isiolo road, you actually can now allow elephants to move back and forth between two gigantic mountains. Yeah. Um, so they're clever enough that we can work with them. But if we don't guide them and we don't put in place those barriers, they will wreak havoc and we will lose elephants before we lose people. That's the, the biggest risk. And what is the response from the, the population living around that area who have previously um, had troubling times with Tim? What are they yeah. saying? I, I think it's still too early to say, actually, Smriti. The local people, of course, were happy that this initiative is being taken yeah. because the money goes towards fences as well as the protection of Tim and the protection of the farms. Um, through this uh, security. Um, it's too early though. We're talking of a population of 1,500 elephants and we've collared just, just one, one for yeah. this particular purpose. So I know that uh, there will be more elephants collared. Only some elephants are problem elephants. Mm -hmm. So of the 1,500, there are probably maybe five or six that yeah. are problem elephants. And if we can stop them from teaching the others, then we can actually contain this problem. But we do need to map their range in such a way that we can zone and keep elephants out of farms and keep farmers out of elephant areas. And that, I think, is the solution that Kenya needs. So we can't afford to keep letting elephants down. All right, perfect way to end this conversation. Paula, we cannot afford to let elephants down. Mm. Thank you so much for your time on NTV Wild Talk and for sharing that most memorable and exhilarating experience, a successful one as well. We will, no doubt, um, go back and look for Tim, won't we? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. You've been watching NTV Wild Talk coming to you from the Wildlife Direct offices here in Nairobi and also from the Amboseli National Park. Time to shift focus. It's time for the Wild Pick segment. Photos that you sent in to demonstrate you love nature and the environment. Timothy Kip Kosge was at the Impala Sanctuary in Kisumu. He was striking a pose in front of the Impalas and says he was there to enjoy himself near animals as a way to embrace the concept of coexistence with wildlife. In Diani, Mombasa, this is Taisha Shah. She was hugging a tree and says, I just love all trees and I'm trying to climb one and hug this palm tree. At Mboni Hills in Makweni County, this is Robert Mutua. He was doing a big star jump on the hills and Robert says that he was there for his love of nature during one of his trips around my lovely country, he says. At the Arboretum, this is Kiki Jo Mbugwa. This was a selfie while having fun with the monkeys and playing with them too. Kiki says, let's give these animals the love that they need rather than chasing them away with stones. And in Lake Nakuru National Park, this is a snap of Stephen Kamau. Stephen was bravely playing with baboons, but you also must be careful and, of course, make sure you have a guide with you if you want to try this. He says he was on a family fun day with his wife and three-month-old daughter. Now, if you want your photo showcased on our Wild Pick segment, just like our NTV Wild Facebook page and send a photo that shows you celebrating nature via private message. Include your full name, tell us where the photo was taken, what you are doing and why. Using cutting-edge technology and partnerships, the collaring of Tim is yet another demonstration of Kenya's commitment to solving human wildlife conflict and to protect its elephant populations. That's it on NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyarthi. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you again next Tuesday at 10 p.m. <laughs> oh my! Mic check, mic check, mic check. Kuchunjo. Ah. Kenya's commitment to to what? Yeah. That'll be an outtake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I saw Bernie's footage. I didn't.
And then I will cut briefly to Katili's. NTV Wild Talk in partnership with the Kenya Wildlife Service and Wildlife Direct.